At this time of our worship, we're going to continue with the reading of scripture. Today's reading of scripture comes from 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 1 to 13. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchushua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men, on the same day together. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley, and those beyond the Jordan, saw that the men of Israel had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Bashan. But when the inhabitants of Jibesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bashan. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you all join me in a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful. Uh, that we have this afternoon, that we have this time, that we have this space to give attention to your word as a church, as a community. Uh, Lord, we come upon the end of this book, the first book uh, of first, the first Samuel. And um, Lord, we learn so much. We learn so much about you. We learn so much about the human condition or the sinful human condition. And so, Lord, as we come upon the final chapter and we look at the end of Saul's life, the end of King Saul's reign, would your spirit continue to teach us? Would your spirit continue to speak to our hearts, speak to our minds as we um, dive into how King Saul's reign, the first king of Israel, how does it all come to an end? And what can we learn from this type of ending? Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Saul, yes, he is the first king of Israel, truly a leader of sorts, but certainly not a perfect one. Sadly, we've had Christian leaders recently who have shown themselves to be far from perfect. For example, the Christian apologist, Rabbi Zacharias. Rabbi Zacharias passed away um, in May 2020, and then after he passed away, allegations of sexual misconduct uh, from Zacharias continued to surface and were investigated. The allegations have all found to be true. Zacharias made excuses to those who are victims of his sexual abuse. And as far as we know, he lived a life of unrepentance in his ministry. We find a life of unrepentance in the life and ministry of Saul, the first king of Israel. And in this 31st chapter, we come to see how this unrepentance comes to an end. How is, how is all this unrepentance, what is the result of all this unrepentance? So, as we look at 1 Samuel chapter 31, we see that it answers three questions for us today. The first is, why should we give attention to our unrepentance? We're going to see that, we've been tracking with this, that 
Saul continually was really unrepentant. We're going to list out the things that he truly didn't really repent from. Maybe at certain times he was remorseful. Maybe he was saddened. But truly he didn't really repent from the things that he did, did wrong as the first king of Israel. But why should we give attention to our unrepentance? Why should we not toss it aside? Why should we not actually really ignore it? Secondly, we're also going to see what can be the root of our unrepentance. So first we're going to see why should we give attention to it? Why should it not be something to ignore? And then second, we're going to see can our unrepentance be traced back to something? Is it really just an incidence of missing the mark, you know, of missing the mark of God's standard? Or can it really be traced back to a root? And this chapter will invite us to consider there could be a root uh, that we can trace back to because of our unrepentance. And then lastly, we're going to see, what does God show to the unrepentant? And if you read through this chapter, just like my previous message, there's no mention of God. (laughs) Interesting. There's no mention of God in this chapter either. But I think there is some subtlety here in the narrative as we close out 1 Samuel that God is still at work. God is definitely still at work, and he shows something uh, to the unrepentant. So let's look at the first one. And we see, why should we give attention to our unrepentance? And we're going to see it's this. Our unrepentance affects not only us, but also those closest to us. We're going to see that through the whole the track, of King Saul's unrepentance, it wasn't just to affect him. It affected everyone in his family. It affected everyone under his rulership. We tend to think, you know, sin in our own lives, okay, it's our own thing. You know, behind closed doors, it's our own thing, right? Between us and the sin. And we hope God doesn't see it, but we know God does see. But I'm going to say our unrepentance affects not only us, it affects those around us as well. And you see this in verses 2 through 6. It says, And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchushua, the son of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor, Draw your sword and thrust me through it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Verse 6, Thus Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men on the same day together. All death. If you've been checking with us in 1 Samuel 28, Saul sought out a medium. He went to divination to try to figure out because God wasn't responding to him. He was seeking after God. He was, he was getting silence. And what does he do? He seeks out a medium in Endor. And the spirit of Saul resurrects, appears, and he, he says a word of judgment. He said a word of judgment to Saul that the kingdom will be taken away from you, Saul. In fact, soon you and your sons are going to join me. Yeah, you're going to die. A word of judgment. Because Saul, in his entire kingship, for the most part, he was unrepentant. And because he was unrepentant, there is judgment that is coming. But notice, it didn't just fall on him. It fell on Jonathan. We don't know about too much about Jonathan's other son. I mean, Saul's other sons. But we know something about Jonathan. He was a great guy. He was faithful to his dad. He was faithful to his best friend, David. He was willing to give over his line of kingship to David because he knew that God had a plan for David's life. He was a faithful guy. Yet in his faithfulness to his father under his rulership, he dies too. He dies too. Under a judgment that's because of Saul's continual unrepentance. Our our unrepentance affects not only us, it can also affect those closest to us, those around us. There are a number of events that Saul had not truly repented of. Saul had not repented from the unlawful sacrifice when he was, while he was waiting for the prophet Samuel. 
Saul had not repented from not devoting to destruction all of Amalek. Saul had not repented from his constant jealousy and hatred against David. And we know that because there were times that he was remorseful, but then after he was done remorsing, he turned back to his jealousy. He turned back to his hatred towards David. Saul had not repented from his murder of God's holy priest in the city of Nob. Saul had not repented from seeking a medium in order to reach the prophet Samuel. He just continued on repentance. Our unrepentance affects not only us, but those closest to us. What brings us to a question for us to consider. Do we realize that our deepest and darkest sins, the ones that we are most unwilling to confess to God and to turn away from, not only affects us, not only puts a wedge between us and our relationship with God, but also puts a wedge between us and other people, those that we are closest to, those that we love. I invite you to think of the time that you wasted and spent time in that sin that you have not repented from. All the profitable and and productive things that you could have done with the people you love, but wasted on that sin. Think of the bitterness and unforgiveness that you are holding or have held over someone who was once a friend to you. Unrepentance puts a wedge between yourself and those closest to you. It doesn't affect just you, it affects those around you. Unrepentant sin robs us from the people and things that matter, the things that God designed to bring us joy and warmth in our hearts. But what can our repentance be traced back to? So we see our repentance affects not only us, but those closest to us. But what can our repentance be traced back to? And this narrative invites us to consider what can be traced back to. And it's this, the root of our unrepentance can be traced back to idolatry. It's really subtle in this narrative where the narrator tells us that all the people of Israel from other neighboring towns, they decide to desert, they decide to abandon. It's sort of like an interesting addition. Right? We see this in verses 7 through 10. It says, and when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those beyond the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. The reason I, I bring this up is because this mention of these Israelites it suddenly points us back to the desire for a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and how this king has now fallen. The Lord pointed out back in 1 Samuel chapter 8 that the Israelites' desire for a king was their rejection of him as king. They wanted to be like all the other nations, and in so doing, have replaced the Lord as king over them. They have replaced their sovereign. In other words, idolatry. This idolatry unfolds even further. If you look further in verses 8 and following, it says, The next day when the Philistines came to strip the land, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Geboa. So they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in a temple of Ashtaroth and they fastened his body to the wall of Bashan. This idolatry, it actually unfolds into God's name being dragged through the mud as the Philistines proclaim their good news to the house of their idols and to their people. This proclamation from the Philistines is to say that their gods are supreme, that their gods are victorious over the true God. What we see here is that our unrepentance can actually be traced back to some sort of idol in our lives. It can be traced back to idolatry, where we take in something that's truly God is on the pedestal, but we replaced it with something else. How has your unrepentant sin manifested itself as really an idol in your life? It could be that you have become self-centered, focused only on you, and not on God. Isn't that how sin often works? We sin because we're focused on on ourselves, because we're self-centered, because we're selfish. We think about our own benefits and how not not about God's plan, not about how it affects other people. 
In fact, this is kind of what happened to Saul, right? He, he focused only on himself. He focused on himself as king. He focused on making sure that the dynasty, that the rulership would not leave his house. He wanted to make sure that his son, Jonathan, would be next king of Israel. But he was focused on himself. Instead of turning away from his sins, instead of being repentant, he didn't turn toward God in faith. He didn't repent. This also happened with the Israelites. The Israelites focused only on themselves. It wanted to be like the other nations. Right? And wanting to be like the other nations, said they went to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and said, give us a king. Give us a king to judge over us. Give us a king who will go before us to fight our battles so that we can be like the other nations. The Israelites focused on themselves in wanting to be like other nations, in wanting someone to go before them to fight their battles. What about you? What is the unrepentant sin in your life? Maybe you didn't repent when we were confessing our sins earlier. Right? Maybe it's easier to confess sins that you, you regularly do, but in your mind, in your heart, it's like, it's not a big deal. But there's definitely one that's like a skeleton in your closet where I, you know, you, you don't, you're not willing to confess that one. You're willing to hold on to that one. But you realize holding to that one means you're putting a wedge between you and God. You, you realize that holding onto that one could be affecting how you interact with those closest to you. You realize holding to that one is like holding an idol in your life. So what have we seen so far? Our unrepentance affects not only us, but also those closest to us. We saw in Saul's life, his unrepentance caused this, this, the, the murder of his own sons. We know that he has at least four sons. We, if we go into 2 Samuel, we see that he has one son left, Ishbosheth. But I can't imagine what a father you know, feels you know, seeing his son just killed. Right? But that's, that was the result of just judgment of his unrepentance. And we see the root of our unrepentance can be traced back to idolatry, can be traced back to this sin is really the idol in my life. Or I'm just so focused on myself that I don't care you know, about God. I don't care about anyone else. It's just me. But God, though he is not mentioned by name in this chapter, um, he has something to show to the unrepentant, which brings us to a third point. What does God show to the unrepentant? It's this. God shows his kindness. We gotta see in this text that God shows his kindness to the unrepentant. And, if, and I guess, yes, that kind of sounds weird, right? Why would he show kindness to the unrepentant, right? He should show, be showing judgment, right? That's, isn't that what happened to Saul? But even though as unrepentant as Saul was, even after his death, there was an act of kindness shown to Saul. And we see this in verses. Um, 11 to 13, it says, But when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the vineyard men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the ball of Bashan, and they came to Jabesh and buried them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. If you remember in 1 Samuel chapter 11, there was an occurrence with Jabesh Gilead where it points to a really high point in the earlier part of Saul's reign. And it's this, he struck down the Ammonites. The Ammonites were oppressing the men of Jabesh. Saul gets word of it, and he rouses up Israel, and he takes down Nahash of the Ammonites. That was a high point in Saul's reign, that he was, the Spirit of the Lord was still upon him, and he went forth, and he got rid of all the Ammonites. Now we see a high point in Saul's reign is not met with the lowest point in Saul's reign. The high point was, yes, he got rid of the Ammonites. The lowest point now is he and his sons are dead. But now the, 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 the inhabitants of Jabesh, they come back. They come back into the scene in verses 11 to 13, and they show kindness 
Right? They recognize that Saul did, the, did a kindness for them, and they come back and say, they heard about what happened to Saul, and they come back and say, we've we got to properly mourn for Saul. We've got to properly mourn for his sons. We've got, we got to take his body off of the shame that the Philistines have done and give him a proper burial and a proper mourning, a proper grieving. The inhabitants of grieved properly, mourned, uh, properly mourned over Saul as an act of kindness. And I can't help but think that God is behind all of this, right? Even in the midst of such unrepentance, kindness is still shown to Saul. Kindness is still shown to Saul. I think of a similar, similar idea that Paul has in his letter to Romans. Right? After Paul, he goes on and says, God's wrath is unleashed against all unrighteousness. And then he has this imaginary dialogue with this Jew, and he says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things, such as the really unrighteous thing that Paul talks about in the latter part of Romans chapter 1. We can leave that for another day. But verse 2 is, he said, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or, and this is the key point, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And I, and I thought that, and I, and I saw, and I read the scene, and I remember what Paul says here in Romans 2, and I'm like, oh, so God seems to be, though he's not explicitly mentioned, there's this sort of connection between God's kindness that's shown to Saul, and this line of unrepentance that spread over Saul's life. And I can't help but think, though he's, he's already dead, that it, it's meant to some sort of repentance for the people of Israel. The intention of God's kindness, the intention that God sent forth his son into this world to die for our sins on the cross and to be raised on the third day. This grace, this mercy, I think is to stand as a contrast to the horror of our sin. It's to stand that our sin is so ugly, but look how beautiful God's grace is. Look how beautiful Jesus is. How can we stand in sin any longer? How can we stand in the ugliness of sin any longer? How can we stand in the horror of sin any longer in light of the beauty of the gospel, in light of the beauty of Jesus, of what he has done for us on the cross? The intention of God's kindness, of his grace and of his patience, is to lead us to repent, to turn back, to turn away from sin, unrepentant sin, and turn towards God in faith. With your unrepentant sin, with the sin that's in your life that you have yet to confess to the Lord because it's just, in your mind, it's just too dark. It's just too dark. It's my skeleton in the closet. And you want to hold on to it. But you realize from what we've seen so far, it affects you and it affects other people. It's, it's leading to back to your idolatry. But God has shown, has shown kindness to you. God has shown kindness. God has shown patience to you. Would you reflect on that? For the unrepentant sin in your life, would you take time to reflect on God's patience towards you? Would you take time to reflect on God's abundant grace towards you? Would you take time to reflect on God's steadfast love and mercy towards you? I've said this before, and I say it again. Preach the gospel to yourself. Preach the gospel to you. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Preach the gospel to yourself. Because the more you preach the gospel to yourself, the more ugliness your sin is. The more you see how ugly it is, the more you see how horrifying it is. So you turn from it, and you turn towards Christ. And you turn towards the beauty of Christ. So what does that take away? I think it's basically this. Our unrepentance is never a small matter. No matter what it is. 
no matter how small you think it is. Because remember, we're, we're going to stand before a perfect and righteous God one day. He is not going to stand for any sin. So any unrepentant sin right now that you have in your life, bring it before the Lord. You know, we've been reading Gentle and Lowly, and I'm reminded, God understands. He's gentle and lowly. He will understand. Bring it before him. Confess it to him. Remind yourself of the grace of God so that you turn from the ugliness of the sin and, and repent from it and turn towards him in faith. Would you close with me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, would you forgive us? Forgive us for the times where we don't see the depth of our sin. Forgive us for the times where we've taken our sin lightly. Lord, you've been so kind to us. You've been so good to us. You have shown your patience towards us. And so, Lord, I pray for everyone that's here that we will continue to dive deep and to reflect on the gospel, the grace, the mercy that you have shown towards us. May that drive us away from any unrepentant sin in our lives. May that drive us away from unrepentant sin and into your grace, into your love, into your loving arms. Because, Lord, our unrepentant sin is no small matter. It drives a wedge between, you and, between us and you. It affects those around us. It dives deep into what we think is worthy of worship. And so, Lord, I pray that, that we dive deep into your grace, turn from our sin, and run towards you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.